All right, three after the hour. Let's go ahead and get started. Um, ba -dum -bum -bum, AI skip. All right, anything from the community people would like to bring up? All right, um, SDK. I think we had a call last week, but I can't remember if there's anything worth mentioning. Clemens or Scott, can you guys think of anything worth mentioning? No. I showed the no. start of a demo of a conformance tool. Oh, that's right. Okay. Um, so wait. Whoops. Did you want to show that off sometime? Uh, let me work on it a little longer. Okay, that's fine. I wasn't going to do it today, but just in general, let me know when you're ready, and we can then uh, uh, schedule time for you to show the group. Sure. All right, so uh, the incubator proposal for the project uh, still scheduled for September 17th. Um, just a reminder, if you have any questions or concerns with the slide deck, um, the link to the PowerPoint is here, the link to the Google Doc is here. Just let me know if you want to make any changes and I can get those in there. Um, otherwise, I think we're pretty much ready to go. Oh, and of course, we're looking for more end users. We only have three listed right now. So if you have more you can add, let me know. I'd like to get a list to be longer than three if possible. Uh, we do have a outline of an agenda for the two sessions at KubeCon. Uh, if you want to add any ad additional items to that list or want your name to be associated with one particular topic, feel free to go ahead and edit that as you see fit. Um, we still have plenty of time, so uh, you know, be thinking about that. And now we get on to PRs. Before we jump into that, any other topics you want to bring up before we get into PRs? All right, cool. In that case, Clemens, I believe you're up first with this data encoding one. You want to refresh your memory where we left off last time? Um, well, I know where I, I know where I was. I'm just not sh sure about everybody else is. Um, <laughs> well, where did? Yeah. So, um, there was a long winded story around uh, having structured data inside of data that um, ended up with what um, we had affected this map as a as a uh, structure um, that was um, independent of encodings. Uh, we gave up on that and we now allow structured data in data in, in the data field, uh, but we only allow it kind of as the encoding define the chosen encoding defines it. Um, what remain and, and so there and with that, uh, specifically in JSON, what we have here. Um, there's no difference between a string and a JSON object because, um, at least from, not from an encoding perspective, because string is just another JSON expression and so is an object and so is an array, et cetera, and that's all permitted. The only thing for which we didn't have a good way to express it was a pure binary because pure binaries are not representable um, in JSON um, itself. Certainly not if we are encoding a structured event where everything is in JSON. So what we had before was this data encoding field. And then we decided that we wanted to probably rename it. Um, and then um, what the end of it is this PR, which is choosing to do away with that field altogether and simply making a rule that's, that is, um, um, says, if you have a, if you look at the, the, the in memory data structure and in memory you find a string or you find an object or you find something that is not, uh, not binary, uh, then you serialize it out as JSON and then you stash it into, the, into a member that is called data. And if you find in your in memory structure a binary, which means there's some binary uh, byte array there. Um, then you you go and take that, you encode it in base64 and put it into a field that is called data underscore base64. Um, and those two are mutually exclusive. And uh, so I made some, there were then some, uh, some suggestions on, um, um, on how to consolidate um, the uh, so first of all, there was a comment that you made, Doug, um, about um, those having to be mutually exclusive. So I I added that 
Um, that's in 135 down there, that's right there. And then, um, as you see, there's a lot of other deletions um, because all of these rules around, you know, detecting whether it's a JSON, um, text JSON, or whether it's a plus JSON, and all those things, they basically completely go away, but us no longer making a difference between our previous um, transcodable way of doing structured data and this JSON model, where we're now effectively trusting that if you have a runtime um, with Good serialization support, like you know, a C sharp app or a Go app or a J or a JSON app, that can, sorry, a JavaScript app that can effectively that can produce a um, conformant document out of an in memory structure, and then you read that back into a memory structure that you can then probably from that memory structure that you created also produce a reasonable um, Avro document. Um, without having too much loss. So we're basically assuming that the serializers will do the right thing here. Um, so that's the, the total of the story, I think. Um, yeah, so that's, so the core of this change really is to do away with all the differences, with all the, the analysis around uh, JSON because we no longer need this with the rule that we have and basically just say, data can occur in two ways, and that is data underscore base64, which always contains base64 encoded, encoded information, and that is always binary, and data which contains all the other types because they're representable then in um, JSON. There's an analog um, in um, the uh, in the MQP encoding, there's a parallel PR that's also pending um, where Evan made some changes. Um, if you would look. I'm trying to see if I can find that one. Hold on a second. I think it's this one. Uh, no, that's the Avro one. There's one. Oh, in, sorry. There's one that he specifically made, or made for MQP. And I think that's in the, I think it's in the hmm. fix up JSON type in the JSON thing. There's a, I think the. This one? That one, yes. Bum, 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 bum. Okay, that's so typo. Here he's, he's, okay. So he's making changes to to MQP. If you go to the comments, I actually have a. Um, oh. So I agree with everything that he did here, but then I made a comment down here. Um, so effect. So MQP has this has the MQP body can occur um, in th three. Forms. There's an MQP value, um, there's an MQP data, and there is an MQP, I forgot because it's rarely used. Um, I think there's an MQP map also, but MQP value and MQP data are the two things that are used mutually exclusively. So we're effectively having a, um, so if we make that extra that extra change, we're effectively symmetric here on between MQP and and JSON because there we have a place where all the where the pure binary goes. That's an MQP data, and if we wanted to have structured data um, inside an MQP message, we put that into a MQP value, and the functionality is exactly the same. The the this is uh, exactly equivalent between the two then. Um, okay, so let's. Let's focus on this one first, just to get one behind us. The, okay, so this is the this is the um, uh, data and, and database sixty four. This is how this looks then. Right. All right. So I think from last time, semantically, I don't think you changed anything. I think it was more syntactical and rewording type stuff, right? Um, yes, that was that was all. Um, I just want to retell the story so that everybody's really on the same page. Um, right. Yeah, I didn't. I made some minor changes um, um, to you know, consolidate. Basically, Evan Evan said you should go and take this and consolidate that with section three because it's set in section two point three, I think. Yeah. And so I consolidated that, and and as I did this consolidating the text, I I just ran into all this um, um, like uh, lines one hundred and forty through one hundred forty one hundred fifty one that then made no longer any sense and I just threw that as well. Right, okay. All right, so let's open it up. Um, do people have any questions or comments for Clemens on this PR? 
I see Tim in the chat is in agreement with the general direction. He may have a wording change for later, but generally it sounds right to him. Anybody else want to comment? Any questions? I'm starting to get a little nervous on how much we're changing right before one. Like, I think uh, we need to give us more more time for all this to soak as uh, we implement the the V1 RC1. So I, I, I definitely think it's a valid concern. Um, I think that's a separate discussion, though, in the sense that I think that goes into when we want to take the vote for 1.0. And so I'd rather focus on that later on in the, in the phone call, if that's OK, Scott. OK. Relative to this particular PR, though, um, I'm, I'm, unless I'm misinterpreting what you said, Scott, are you comfortable with this one, or do, would you want more time to review this one as well? I, I think these are changes that make sense. Okay. There's a lot of changes, so I would have to, you know, pick through it. Okay. Well, yeah, like I said, I'd like to focus, you know, on the smaller little pieces, do baby steps. And if people are okay with this general direction, then I'd like to get that behind us and then deal with the more abstract of, do we need more time to review 1.0 before we actually call it 1.0 is a separate discussion. So any other questions or comments on this one? Mark, you were up there for a sec. Did you change your mind? Well, I, I was going to ask Scott if he did feel that this was 1.0 worthy. I'm just trying to nuance your uh, Scott's comment. Yeah, I, I don't I don't know because I haven't used it in a live system yet. I don't know the interop story because the a fair amount of pieces have changed and the though I agree with the base 64 data piece the change uh, it's going to make version upgrades very difficult like going from one to two to th three to version one there's a there's a lot of api breaking changes we've made in the last few weeks that are going to be difficult to to understand how to migrate in current running systems yeah, we have we have since since we killed map we call we 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 cause we cause we cause things to break and and we need to go and clean them up and so that's one of the cleanup items effectively yeah so that we we made the breaking change where we now have, have debt from it and we need to go and deal with that debt yes and i i agree with the killing the maps that's it simplifies a lot of things for http binary mode but upgrading to 10 is is going to be very difficult well, so I'm trying to figure out, Scott, whether I'm trying to figure out, Scott, whether your comments are along the lines of maybe you don't want this PR, or along the lines of just sort of more like venting. It's like, it, yeah, I'm not happy about it, but yeah, it's the right thing to do. No, I, I am happy about it. Uh, there's just a lot of changes happening. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's just it, yeah. Okay, that's fine. And, then, then, you know, people are going to deal with the ramifications of these changes that we've agreed to. It's that's sort of a given. Yeah. I think okay. ultimately, ultimately, this is really a, the reason why this sits in the JSON, why this sits in the JSON encoding and why the, there's another one that's, is, that's over in the AQP encoding is that those are really changes that only have to do with a wire representation and they don't affect the, the, the model per se, right? There's a, the way how this would show up to an, uh, the way how this will surface to an application is still there is data, right? And there's a, the in memory representations towards the app will be that there's a, either there's a byte array or there is um, um, an object graph that you can interact with. And based on, based on that difference, the wire representation will be different, but the in memory representation should be stable and it should still be, um, accessible through whatever the abstraction of that respect of the respective APIs for data that should not change. The only there's really only a restriction in that JSON can't represent uh, binary well, and then there is a special convention with AMQP that if you have binaries, you should put, you should stick to them in data. But these are only two differences that have to do with the wire format. Yep. Okay. Thank you. 
So another round of questions. Any questions or comments? Any objection to approving the PR? Can we approve right. the PR in the PR? In, what do you mean by in the PR? Can we can we get uh, collect a, a couple LGTMs? I'd, I'd like a little time to pick through it again. So you want to do a offline vote, basically? Yeah, people should go and look at the PR and LGTM at the bottom. We could, if you really want to. Um, Love it. it I'm, I'm just trying to figure out what's the. Uh, okay. It sounds like Scott, you're saying you, you'd like a little bit more time. Is which aspect? I'm just curious, which aspect of this is the most concerning to you? Is it just the the introduction of the uh, of the underscore base sixty four version? Yeah. So has anyone tried to use that yet? It, it adds a little complexity to the the receivers. Yeah, but it's also killing an entire attributes and further complexity by by not relying on that extra field. It's like it's literally just so this is effectively just taking the marker that we have in data encoding with base sixty four. It's taking that marker, it's it's effectively moving that into the member name, if you will. Like from a from an information from information content a content perspective, it's I would argue exactly the same. So it's less complicated than it was, and we're eliminating a bunch of extra, a bunch of rules as well. Yeah, so I'm, I guess Scott, what I'm trying to figure out is if we if we decide not to approve it right now and try to approve it offline, in your mind, what will change between now and when you finally type LGTM? Well, people will read it. <laughs> well, you know how that goes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. I, I'm just I'm just worried that we're delaying it for no real reason. I mean, if you're saying you you personally need more time to think about it, and you know actually implement it, that that'd be one thing. But if you're doing it because you want to get other people to do stuff, uh, just realistically, I just don't see that's going to happen. People have already it's been out there for two weeks now, basically. Okay. So I'd, I'd like to. And unless there's an objection and someone, you know, if it, I, I don't want to, I don't want to force it on you, Scott, but I, but if, if all it is is trying to get other people to do stuff, I just don't, we haven't had much luck with that. So that's why I don't want to push it. I, I delayed think, unnecessarily. Yeah. We, I think if we want to stick to our timeline uh, by getting this all done before the, before the beginning of October, we have to go and make some, make progress yeah. on those ones. And just and just to remind everybody, you know, even if we do approve this right now, that doesn't mean it's a done deal, right? During this whole review period that we have lined up for ourselves, if somebody comes up with a reason why this is a bad move, we could always revert it and go a different path. You know, we're not 1.0 yet, so we still have that flexibility. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay. Okay, so uh, just to make it more official, any objection to approving this PR? All right, cool. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Next is Evans clarification. That's this one. Um, unfortunately, I don't see Evan on the call. So let me ask a quick question here. Okay. So I don't think he has any drastic changes since last time. There are a couple of RFC wording changes here, but I don't think that actually changes anything from the intention of, of this one. Um, Scott, do you know enough about this one to talk to, or do you want me to try to mumble my way through it? I can't wait for you to mumble. <laughs> mumble, fumble. I think most of this is, the, the beginning part was just syntactical and changes, I believe. Um, I don't, I don't remember what he did. Now that we've removed other changes, I think he clarified that there's a mapping between data content type and the content type header. For HTTP, I think that was one change. Just made that a little clearer. And oh, I think the reason one of the reasons we went back there was the percent encoding stuff. So I think this section down here it might be a little bit new um, or reworded because it talks about the percent encoding and this and, and when to do it and make sure you don't do it twice, that kind of stuff. Let me hide the comments here for a sec, make it easier to review. 
It's the button right next to it, I think. Yeah, I think I already got that. So I think yeah, I think everything else is just syntactical. So I think this is really the bulk of the section of the change yeah, right he here. Made, he made an update. There, there, I think there were more. Um, he had more encoding rules, and uh, after Tim brought the wonderful update to clarify what a string is for all here, um, he um, collapsed that into something that's a little bit more simple. Right. All right. So, Jim, welcome back from your break, and your hands up. It is. Thank you. Um, now, one, I haven't looked at this, to be honest, but if you could wind the screen back up again, there was something to do with changing, stop, down a bit, down a bit, uh, the data content type. Why did, why are we having to do that? Treat those Wait headers differently. Um, Wait, which, oh, it, it, oh this, it, talk about this section? No, the one further down. The all, down here? All, all C attributes with the exception of data content type must be individually mapped. That was that was there f from the beginning. I was okay. Yeah, because what we did is we were effectively taking the data, the data content type and making that the content type of the um, uh, like the proper the proper uh, content type of the message because we're putting we're sticking data into the um, into the HTTP entity body. So those fields are directly corresponding, which means we're no longer we're, we're not making that. We're not replicating that um, into the um, cloud events bucket, so that's that doesn't change. Okay. All right. Yeah, I think I think technically the wording change here is out of the word the. I think everything else is just a word wrap or a line wrapping thing, yeah. for the most part. And, and of course we, yeah, and of course you move the data. So I think, but this is, I think down here is the bulk of the change. So Clemens and. Heinz, because I think not Heinz, Klaus. Klaus, I think you may have looked at this one as well, but as well as Clemens. What are your guys' opinion on this one? So I think I, I know you two have reviewed us. Um, I believe that is correct. So the the if you find a string, so we assume that all strings are are Unicode, but if you find a string that is um, uh, has non valid is not valid as an HTTP header. You run percent percent encoding on it um, when you encode it, and then when you take it, then you percent decode it, and that's um, then giving you back a Unicode string again. Yeah, the one thing that kind of confused me was why he had to call out this notion of a single round of percent encoding. I'm not sure. I should why anybody would think they would need to do more than one round of percent encoding, but it seemed like a minor thing. Yeah. People, people do all weird, all kinds of weird things. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe there's, maybe there's pain in that line. Maybe. All right. Um, Klaus, am I remembering incorrectly? Did you, I thought you had a comment on this PR at some point. That's why I picked on you a little to comment mm -hmm. here. Uh, maybe not. Maybe, maybe I'm missing. And maybe I'm remembering it correctly. I remember reading but, it, not commenting. Okay. Well, do you or anybody else on the call have a comment on this one or a question? I don't actually think it changes a whole lot, to be honest. I think it's more of a clarification text. Um, I, I, but I think um, irres irrespective of whether the, the, the string does or does not contain um, characters outside the ASCII range, you have to run percent encoding anyways. Because percent encoding, so, so I think we need to make the rule, like you, if you store a header in, an, if you store a value in an HTTP header and you take a Unicode string in, you have to percent encode it. And you have to, Because because you could run into um, you may have percent signs in in that which are in, in the permissible range, and those you have to percent encode as well. So um, so are you just reiterating what he says here, or do you are you suggesting a wording change? No, no, no. He says 
He says string well is which contain Unicode characters outside the ASCII range. And I'm saying even if you look at that string and it is all within the ASCII range, because it may also contain the, the percent character, which needs to be escaped, um, which then, which then is, is not correct with that rule, you have to go and use a percent encoding in all cases. So basically you want to replace this whole paragraph with just percent okay. encode the values. I, want to, I, I just want to, want to remove the clause. String values must be percent encoded. Just get rid of that text yes. right there. Yes. What other people think? Does that seem right? Um, I'm trying to figure out if this is the kind of change that we can agree to now and I can ask Evan to make and we can just merge the pair later or do people need more time to think about that? I, th I think this is, is exactly in the right direction. And the thing that we need to do, because we have, that will close the hole that we have. Um, but, uh, so I would, I, would, I would approve pending that change. Okay, what other people think? You, is everybody on the call comfortable with approving the PR conditionally with, these, with this highlighted section being removed? Not hearing any objection. I'm not hearing people jump up and down overly excited either. Heinz, go for it. Heinz, you have to come off mute. Sorry. There we go. Saying it, that I believe that it should be approved since most people only uh, will bring up the negative. Okay. Hold on a minute. Okay, anybody else want to comment? Okay, let me ask the question. Is there any objection then to approving this PR with the removal of the highlighted text? All right, not hearing any objection. Cool, thank you guys. Okay, let's go back to this fix up JSON mapping thing. So Clemens, you briefly talked about this one, since I know that implies you've actually reviewed it. Do you want to say, yeah, because you already sort of talked about it in the context of the other PR, um, but is there anything else you want to add to the changes? I think this is the bulk of the changes right here. These are, these are effectively just editorial changes that are necessary because we didn't um, track them all. Um, so he's, is effectively removing the mapping of map. It doesn't preclude that you can use the NKP map uh, because you're free to use whatever you like for data. Um, but the, there's no, so we only have data now and we don't have the, the, the any type and the map type anymore. So, so that um, needs to go, that wording. Um, and the only thing that needs changing here um, is I believe, um, is uh, the um, 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 the comment that I made with uh, adding MPP value support, and Christoph is making a comment in the PR. So this this is one yeah. this is one that this is one also that um, there are two changes, but I don't think there is um, nobody should have an objection to um, fixing up the the necessary things for MPP. Okay, hold on, I'm thinking some notes here. I'm getting, okay, so let's go back to your comments. I, Christoph, I made a comment on yours um, in my notes. So, oops, darn it, what did I do? Good golly, what am I doing? Hold on, I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> my screen is like responding ever so slowly today, so it's really throwing me off. We're on the fix up one, so hold on a minute. There we go. Okay, so on this comment here, it wasn't clear to me, what, what change are you asking for, Clemens? Um, I am asking for, there's a, it says um, in the data section, the way how the data section is stored, it says the data is stored in MPP data field. That's what the PR says. Okay, um, hold on. Effectively what this needs to do is it needs to, it needs to do the same, um, 
So this, that. Well, that's data payload shall be mapped to a single AVP data section. The AVP data section is per se um, um, binary only, which means if you now have structured data inside of the in memory data field, you can't stash it in there because there's no, there's no serialization model for this. But AVP value is a serialization model for that. So um, effectively, you would take the text that I have in the JSON the, the, in the JSON um, uh, PR, we say if this is a binary, you store it into data. If this is sorry, into data uh, data basic four, and if it's anything else, you store it into a data member. Exactly the same same thing happens here, where you go and take if it's a binary, then you stash the stash it into MQP data, and if it's um, a, anything else, you stash it into MQP value. MQP per se has that sort of distinction built in. Okay, so I, I think conceptually that, that makes a whole lot of sense, but because that's more than just like a couple of wording change, it actually introduces a whole other sentence or two, possibly talking about a different attribute. Um, we can table that. I, I, yeah, I was going to say, I don't think we could, I don't, I feel uncomfortable approving that right now. Okay. Um, yeah, can you do me a favor though? Can you put the exact text that you'd like to see as a comment inside the PR right here. So that way it's really easy for Evan to just copy and paste. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. I think that'll speed things along. Okay. Any other questions or comments on this or concern with, with the direction we're headed here? Okay. So I'm assuming people are okay with that general direction. We get those changes in. So I want to say comments to Okay, cool. Um, Avro mapping. Let's see. Where are we on this one? Okay, Clemens. Yeah, I'm not happy with that change. Wait, you're not? Is that what you just said? Not, with, that, with that change in particular, I'm not happy, no. Okay, what about this one worries you? Um, so what he does now is he did a, so this, so this schema exists not to perfectly describe an event, a cloud event in Avro, but it exists so that we can, so the schema exists so that we can even serialize an event in Avro because Avro is this, um, is a format that requires a schema to do serialization at all. And so it has this recursion um, so that you can go and, and effectively serialize structured data inside of the data field. That's why the recursion existed. Um, so now we changed the rules around data and we took, so we took the map thing away. Um, but, and now he made a change that the, that data is always a type, is always bytes. So again, that doesn't, that's not symmetric with how, what we do with JSON because in JSON we can have structured data instead of, of uh, data. And so um, the recursion that the old schema has where you know, data can contain um, uh, any, other, any other field um, is that something that we need to preserve, otherwise we can't, we can't take um, a structured data into that field. So there's a, this, is a, this is effectively a, f a change in, in how the Avro serialization works because we are constraining the serialization um, uh, schema. We're not, so the schema is a little different in that it doesn't, it's not a validation thing as you would have that for JSON schema. This is, this is the thing that actually drives the serializer. So with, with that change, we would take the serializer's ability away to deal with structured data, structured information inside the data field. And that's why I don't like it. Okay. And I don't think he had a chance to comment back to you on that one. No, he hasn't. So that's something right. that, is, that we need to leave pending on the, until next week. Yep, okay. Heinz, I don't know if your off mute is a new one or an old one. Did you have a comment on this? Well, you know, my feeling about adding these extra serialization, but uh, I, I still believe that uh, Clement's point is very valid where uh, we're using the constraints of the serialization to kind of bend the spec, which is kind of the reverse. Okay. 
Are there, are there additional changes you'd like to see beyond what Clemens said? Uh, no, actually, I think the main one is, as Clemens points out, is the uh, data field and uh, eliminating the structured data type if it's all going to be uh, byte arrays. Okay. okay. Any other comments on this one then? Any disagreement with the with the proposed changes that Clemens was talking about? Okay, so we obviously can't approve that one. Hold on a minute. Um, okay. Um, uh, before we move on to the next one, uh, yes, yes, I please. Think there is another transport uh, uh, event format that we're missing, which is the protobuf. I don't know if Evan wants to open a PR. Oh, um, that's because right. I forgot about that. Yeah, I, I can. I'm not a protobuf uh, expert. I can volunteer to do one, but I just do what a newbie in protobuf would do. So maybe someone That's else. Probably not bad. Sorry? Yeah. That's probably not terrible. Well, I know Evans did mention it somewhere. I can't remember where that he was going to take a look at the protobuf one, but I don't think he had a chance to do it yet. Um, but yeah, Christoph, if you want to take a, I'm sorry, was that Christoph? No, though, who was it? Was that Christoph? Yeah, yeah it was me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Christoph, if you want to take a first pass at it, go for it, because I know Evan is busy as well. Okay. Sign me up for it. Oops. Not, not Clemens. <laughs> Christoph. Uh, okay. I take it as a compliment. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like assigning stuff to Christoph. I mean, to Clemens. So, okay. Uh, let's see. All right. I'm going to pick on Scott here. Since Evan is not on the call, you get to be his proxy. I think you had some comments on this one, um, Scott. You want to explain the issue? Yes. So there, there's a there's an issue in um, there's an issue with HTTP binary where the extensions that you might add don't don't flow through middleware and then turn back into what you expected on the uh, HTTP side again, because the spec says you have to prefix all extensions with the CE dash in the header. Uh, the spec allows you to send other things that are not prefixed, but there's no guarantee that that, that uh, extra extension that's unknown to the middleware will actually make it to the other side. So, Cloud events becomes a very lossy protocol if you switch the transports. So the, let's let's click the distributed tracing thing so we understand so we can understand that issue. So so what this does here is that the the for HTTP so this extension has a special rule for HTTP, which says you don't take you don't take the trace. You don't call this CE dash trace parent, and you don't call this CE dash trace state, but you really use the W3C default headers um, and and use those. It's, so not the CE ones, and and you don't send the CE you don't send the the CE prefix. Of course, middleware, as rightly stated, that is not aware of um, that mapping um, will then basically pass that event through, but it will pass that event through with HTTP headers. And if there is an unaware intermediary and that will then not send HTTP along, but it will send APP along, um, it might then, strip the might then strip the information at the CE level. That is correct. However, um, that is a decision that the extension makes. So this is not a general problem, but it's a, it's a decision that the extension just made here because it's a, it, it decided that it wanted to have a, a different mapping. Specific, well, but it, right? It is a, it's a different, uh, so uh, HTTP using JSON would not be lossy over multiple protocols that also publish JSON bodies because, because of the, the way that things are bundled. Yeah, yeah, but it because was, we but, have to, because we have to change the header name, uh, HTTP in binary mode is, is kind of at a loss 
so so let's but but it does so this is th this rule here right is causing this so it's not it's nothing that's in the it's nothing that in, that is in the score core spec or in our HTTP binding it's really that this extension chooses to do this it chooses to do the override we we permitted the override specifically for that purpose now here's why that's right if you use distributed tracing and if you use HTTP then it, so these, these mappings go both ways. It is legitimate for, a, for you to send a cloud event to a proxy. And the proxy, let's say Envoy, decides that there's a configuration that it now wants to go and add W3, a W3 trace context into that, into that um, message because the application doesn't care about it and it doesn't have tracing. So you want to go and start doing tracing as a, as a, uh, by intermediary effectively. You want to do a, um, um, you want to do that by the interceptor. Now, now that is just standard tracing capability that is that the Envoy proxy adds and it adds trace parent trace state. Now, if you deserialize a cloud event and you have that extension activated, so to speak, you get that inje injected context back into your cloud event because we have this mapping. And that's a, that's a function of HTTP and a function of this whole trace context um, story that is intentionally so. So, so what we're, and, and because there's also a mapping for, so in this trace context world, um, they have a mapping to HTTP, they have a mapping to NQP, and they have a mapping to MQTT, and they actually make rules that if you get an HTTP request, um, and then you use, you make any request for which a binding exists, then you have to go and pick up that trace pair and then trace state, and you have to use it in a downstream, in, in any downstream request, you, which means you are supposed to propagate it, which means specifically for trace context, the propagation is guaranteed more or less by the trace context specification um, and not by us. That's why that's legit. But that's a, that's a problem that exists specific in quotes, a problem that exists um, and where we're handing off control because this HTTP mapping here chooses to do that. But it's not a, not a problem we have in principle. It's not something that is, is if we define an extension and we don't make, make that extra rule, then all the, the extension attributes will obviously be CE prefixed and then they will also be propagated. Okay, so I think the order of people who raised their hands is Christoph, myself, and then Jem. So Christoph, I think you're first. One thing Scott said was that this would only apply to the binary, uh, HTTP binary, but if I'm reading this correctly, it should also apply to the structured mode or the uh, you should also use the headers in the structured mode for the other libraries to work. And one solution, I maybe it's not a good one, but could be to duplicate them. So to use those headers and then also have it in the structured or in the binary in the headers twice. I know it's more data, but maybe then both ways are being served. Um, well, this is a particular that? case for tracing because it must be in the headers. Yes, so, and and I would so that's that's a big, that's something that makes that also makes sense to me, to do the duplication. So basically, so I th I think to solve this particular problem, we can make a clarification in this spec. That oh, that talks sure. about that maybe talks about has a sentence or two about what I just said, um, and then uh, clarifies that the data should be duplicated into the HTTP headers and then should or should also be carried in, in CD headers. That sets out something that we have in, so in trace context, Microsoft is proposing in W3C and NQP binding. Um, there's a draft out there and I don't know what, when and why that hasn't settled because W3C is even slower than we are. Um, but that proposal, since NQP's message it's not changeable once you send it, um, but this is about propagating state um, through intermediaries. Um, the thing we're proposing there is that you um, have to, um, any changes you make to the trace context um, go, so the trace, original trace context goes into the properties of the message and then 
um, any changes need to be uh, need to go into the annotations of the MPP, uh, MPP message, which means there's also um, duplication there. The 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 advantage of that is um, that you now get effectively two trace context paths. One is you get the trace context as it originated in the application. That is what would end up in the CE dash header because HTTP and HTTP infrastructure doesn't know about this and won't touch it. And then you have the, the trace context fields which are presented to the HTTP infrastructure. And if the HTTP infrastructure wants to manipulate the context, because that's like a breadcrumb thing that happens, like you, can, you take your input trace context and then you make changes to it, and then you, you stamp your outbound message with the new trace context. Um, that gives you now two paths. One is end-to-end, -end, where it's literally just cloud event to cloud event to cloud event with all the transport inter infrastructure in the middle. And then um, at the HTTP level, you get all the, it, all the infrastructure traces and, and all that context um, along with it. So it basically sets up two paths, if you will, where you have one layer, which is end-to-end -end tracing, one layer, which is uh, tracing with all the transports in the middle. If we if we duplicate it, that's why the duplication probably makes sense. Sorry, sorry, Clements. Okay. I, I think it's this issue is much more simple than than I think the distributed tracing link is throwing you off. What we're actually talking about is if you add the header foo, yes, it gets dropped. No, it doesn't. So if you add, so so that's the point. The distributed so, tracing. So, hold, hold, hold on a sec. I, I, I let it go just because it's it's enjoyable listening to you talk sometimes, Clemens. But we do have a speaker queue. <laughs> right. So hold on just a sec. I'll go back to 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 you in a second, Clemens. Let me let me hit the other people in the queue first. So I actually raised my hand to raise the exact same point that I think Christoph did about how this only applies to uh, if, I'm sorry, it applies to both binary and HTTP. But I also wanted to comment that I don't believe this is a cloud event specific issue. I think if you have a piece of middleware today that suddenly starts to process cloud events, it doesn't necessarily even know it's doing cloud events necessarily. And it's going to either drop or pass along these, these HTTP headers per its current rules in processing. So I don't think introducing cloud events necessarily changes anything, right? It's either going to take all unknown headers and pass them along or it's going to drop them. And I don't think cloud events changes that at all. And so as I personally don't see it as a problem because as kind of what Clemens was hinting at earlier is this extension is chosen to live on the edge by not prefixing things with CE and living by the other rules. So I, I don't necessarily view this as a problem because I think the problem exists today even without cloud events. So that's all I wanted to say. But I think, Jem, your hand's up next, and then we'll go to Scott and Clemens. I, I think my comments were along similar lines in that really it sounds like what this cloud event extension is saying is we want to use a W3C tracing. Um, and so in reality, it should be that spec that's dictating how the transport encodings work. Because the, realistically, the trace context is not, it, it, is it really an attribute of the cloud event? I, I think that's the thing, or is it an attribute of the uh, the larger processing and then a transported context. Um, that, so I think we're probably talking about the same thing, um, but but it does sound like Scott had a bigger issue than just um, tracing. Yeah, so sure I got myself across there. Okay, well, Scott, um, actually since I interrupted Clemens, Clemens, I'll let you go and then Scott, you're next. Yeah, Scott made the made comment that, that generally they are dropped in the HTTP binary mode, the attributes, and they're not. So HTTP binary mode forces prefixing for all the, the cloud events context attributes, which, are, which is also true for extensions. And only if the, only if the extension chooses to override, which the, the, the tra this tracing extension does, and that's the only one that does that, then do the change do the the rules change for that particular header and then yes if that then it gets lost if uh, it uh, doesn't um, uh, if the intermediary doesn't know about it but that's that's something that you effectively buy into when you follow the rules of that extension 
Okay, Scott, you, I think your hand's up next. Yeah, so, so I, I think it, it does drop it if you convert to another transport and then back to HTTP. That's, and that's the issue. You, you can't just, you can't decorate the, um, the event with, you know, your extension headers and expect them to show up on the other side. So that's true if you don't follow the trace context rules. So if you follow the trace context rules, which you effectively invoke when you, when you, when you use that extension. Um, no, 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 For, forget trace. To... Forget trace, just like add, add your own header to it. If you, if you decorate anything in HTTP binary mode and you don't prefix it, yeah. cloud events will drop it. Well, that's correct because then you're just you're just decorating the transport frame and that doesn't go end to end. So I, I would propose that we drop extensions uh, having CE in them. I would actually go the other direction and require all extensions to have CE in them. But you're modifying the HTTP object. What do you mean? Like you you can't go from so look at this little. So you go from a client to HTTP to yeah. some sort of middleware. Yeah. And let's say it, it ends up HTTP again. Yes. But what the client sent is not what the processor is going to get. Yeah, but, but so, so HTTP per se. So you're not setting up an HTTP proxy route, right? You're, you're sending, you're routing a, a cloud event through multiple hops. And what you're entitled to is everything that's part of the cloud event, but not everything that's part of the original HTTP message. Right, but one of the pitches that Doug's made is that cloud events is just adding four headers trademark. But that that's not quite right because if you just add those four headers, uh, almost all of your message in the headers gets dropped. But, but so, so are you saying that if you go to you create an HTTP message and you put a cloud event in there and then you also add the header foo to the HTTP event, to the HTTP message, that you expect that header foo to show up on the other side? Yes. I don't think that's, that's a reasonable expectation. Yeah, I would agree, because I don't think that has anything to do with cloud events at that point. Well, so if you have an existing webhook endpoint, it invokes you, and you want to turn that webhook into a cloud event, it should be as simple as adding so the, the, a couple attributes into the header keep the payload the same, keep the headers the same, and then middleware shouldn't drop it no matter what transport it goes over. Yeah, but you can't expect that because there's, there's a bunch of headers in HTTP which only makes sense inside of HTTP. That's right, so we could, we could choose to drop the, the known not doesn't make sense headers and keep everything and expect them, if it's, if it's not a known uh, HTTP context header like content length, doesn't make sense to send along. We drop those and we bring along everything else. The, the only way the only way this works is if you treat if you if you stay at the cloud of it, you, you can't start at the at the transport layer. You have to start you have to start with a cloud event with definitions of the cloud event and then you map that to a transport layer. You can't start with an HTTP message and expect that um, everything that's in that HTTP message will then end up in that cloud event. That doesn't work. So let's let the, we've since running a little on time here. Let me go to the people in the queue. We may have to stop after Christoph. So I think it's Heinz and then Christoph. So Heinz, go ahead and go first. I think your hand is up. Yeah, just two quick things. One is it doesn't magically go from HTTP to some AMQP broker. You're going to need to use a mediation layer where you've got to put some kind of code to do that, where even the cloud events headers between HTTP and AMQP do not use the exact same name for the name value pairs in the header. So you have to have some mandatory processing in between. And I would assume, and again, maybe that's a bad assumption, but that uh, um, that is then under the control of whoever's doing the transformation from an HTTP transport to an AMQP middleware transport. So if there's gotta be code, it's gonna be some developer who can make that decision. I don't think you can mandate as you're going in between, especially since we don't use, 
at least the specification for the two transports, do not have the exact same header values, at least as far as the name and the name value pairs. Okay, uh, Christoph, I think you're up next. Yeah, I wanted to comment on the add four headers to your existing HTTP call and then you've got a cloud event. I think that's a catchy marketing claim and it's good at that, but it's not the full specification. So it works in some cases where you're, uh, you only use the HTTP body to transport your message, but it doesn't work if you also use the headers. So I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't take it to literally, I would take it as a marketing claim to get people interested and listening, but maybe it's not ideal to strive for that this becomes uh, in all edge cases also uh, represented in our specification. I think you just criticized me for being too close to marketing. I'm not quite sure, but okay. No, I didn't try. To. No, I said it's a catchy marketing claim against people interested. That's what marketing do. But I know. I'm just joking. No, I agree with you. If, if you, All right. I, so, so go ahead, more, come, last up. If you have a custom header that's called my API key, and then you put the API key in there, um, if all headers ought to be forwarded, you're now leaking the API key because the intermediary doesn't know. So, so you can't. Right? The, the, there's there's all kinds of stuff that is literally just hop to hop that you can't blindly forward without having a rule for it. And the rules that we have for forwarding things is by making those cloud events attributes. Okay, and with that, I think we're gonna have to call it time because there's two things I wanna do. First, it sounds to me, based upon some of the changes we proposed to, um, to some of the open PRs that we actually are not ready to claim, even with these current PRs that we just approved today, that we have an RC1. Because I think, for example, we have, uh, Evans to PRs, they need to get resolved. Um, does anybody disagree or do you, does anybody think we actually should try to push for RC1 with today's approved PRs? Okay, I'm not hearing any objections. So we'll, we'll, we'll push this date out to um, the 12th. We'll, so we'll try again for next week. So please work on your PRs and get your comments in there. Um, try to get them out this week because if you wait till next week, it, Thursday will come up really, really fast and people will have time to review it and think about it, especially since Tuesday is the deadline for normative changes. And finally, um, Doug, M, and Fabio, are you guys there? I want to make sure I get you on the yep, roll. I'm here. Fabio. Okay, I got Fabio. And Doug, are you there? Doug's here. All right, cool. Anybody else that I missed for a roll call? All right, and just to be clear, what's going on in the chat relative to the protobuf? Who's, who has the AI to work on the protobuf stuff? So uh, Scott said they internally agreed to drop it, the whole thing. So he's gonna make a PR to do that and then there's no point in me making a change to the protobuf spec itself. Okay, okay. Sorry, cool. that, sorry, hold on a minute. You're gonna drop protobuf bindings altogether? I won't, Scott will. <laughs> <laughs> That's the proposal, whether it gets agreed upon or not, who knows. Do, do we know why? Sorry. I'm assuming they'll mention why they want to do that in their PR. Uh, short reason is the, the current protobuf is uh, broken and uh, it's not something you'd actually want to use or promote. And if, if we V1 with that protobuf, uh, we're stuck with it forever. So it'd be safer to remove it. It was a I giant they... fight to get that in here, but okay. Yeah, yeah I, but well, the I mean, compromise I... that we had to make to get that into the spec uh, broke it. Okay. Or, okay. Okay. All, all I would say is if if we're pushing in Avro, then we should do Proso at the same time, even if it means reworking it. But like, we can take that offline. Yeah, we do need to take our line because taking over time. So last reminder, please add all your comments to Evan's issue they were just discussing about why it's a good or a bad idea to do what he's suggesting or if you have other alternatives, like I think someone said, duplicate the data between CE and normal headers. So please put comments in there so we can try to resolve that one during the next week or so. All right. And with that, we're slightly over time. I apologize for running late, but thank you guys very much. And we will talk again next week. Thanks, guys. Bye. Thank you. Okay, bye. Thank you very much. Bye.